Good evening and welcome to Pains of Power Leading with Love. And I am Maria, also known as Brown Girl Interrupting. I'm so glad to have you all here with me tonight and watching. Um, and we have a very special treat because today we are going to be talking with an, a, a group of women who are filmmakers and creatives. But before we do, I want to share a little bit with you, you know, um, a lot of the show is about the idea of pain to power. That's what the show is. And and my my title is Brown Girl Interrupting because so much of who I am is is being a woman. Um, but in particular, it's it's being a mother to a daughter and the the layers of generational being a woman. Um, and the other day I was actually having a conversation with a good friend of mine, and she said to me something that really made a big impact on on my thinking, which is just that. Uh, that she said, you are living your life fully as an independent woman and your daughter gets to see that. That is so huge. And and I thought about that because five years ago, if you read my blog and if you follow me, you'll know that that's not what my life was. I was not living like that. And I think the power of living our lives and visibly being openly who we are is part of the pain to power journey for me as a woman. And today I'm so excited to share with you three women who have been creating the voices and spaces for other women and other spaces for uh, individuals to recognize the power of storytelling. And so as you can see, I'm really glad to have you here. We are going to be talking to the direct, the creative directorial team of Hashtag Make Us Visible, which is a documentary, as you can see, featured on the Queen's World Film Festival site. The link is all below here. Please make sure you go and watch the documentary after you, our show today. It is featured from, this is the virtual kickoff of the festival, and you will be able to see all the films from November 20th today until December 4th. So please make sure you go and watch that. We are being simulcasted on Queen's World Film Festival and the Ranchers Union and on the Ranchers Network as well here and on Brown Girl Interrupting. And so without any further ado, I'm so excited to introduce you to this creative directorial team. I have Maimuna Anika, Clara Francesca, and Anne Witchman with me today. So welcome. <laughs> I love, I love the enthusiasm. Woo! It was wonderful. Yeah, we're so excited to be here. Thank you very, very much for having yeah. us. Oh, I am so excited to have you here. And I see we already have some of our Ranchers Union family. So salute to Tennessee. What up? And salute to Mr. Jones, 169. Good evening. And I love it, Queen's World Film Festival. These women, these women, these women, for sure. The powerful, powerful women here in this space. So I would first like to give you an opportunity to introduce yourselves to our audience um, about who you are and just what it is that you do or what you've been doing and a little bit about your role in hashtag Make Us Visible. Hello, everyone. My name is Maimuna Anika. Uh, I am a senior in CUNY Hunter College, and uh, I've interned with XRE with Clara and Anne through an amazing program called Media Makers by an amazing company, RealWorks. And I got the opportunity to make the documentary film for Hashtag Make Us Visible, and I enjoyed making the film so much. And it was an amazing experience to work with Anne, Clara, and the whole XRE team. And I'm so happy to be here. 
My honor. It's an honor to work with you. My name is Clara Francesca. I'm a solo theater artist. I like to brand myself as a philosopher of the heart, making art. And I am one of the co-founders of XRE uh, with Anne, which is just a, one of my greatest joys in life. And Anne had this vision to make this uh, event called Hashtag Make Us Visible in January. Well, December of last year, and then we made it possible this year with Katie Peyton Hofstetter and Nam Le, who are featured in the documentary, so you can get more information around them. And we had the absolute pleasure of meeting Siobhan at Real Works, who introduced us to Maimuna and made this documentary that we got to, to feature for the Queen's World Film Festival. So that's a little bit about me. And I'm Anne Witchman. I'm the other co-founder of XRE, the Extended Reality Ensemble. And I'm a musician, performer, performance artist. And um, together with Clara, I'm uh, super excited to create art and to perform together, as well as curate shows or realize ideas that we have, like the idea for Make Us Visible. It was clear to us we are not augmented reality artists, we are not digital artists, but we think that the idea is worth pursuing. And so we figured, let's do this. Let's do this with our networks and let's reach out to other women um, to realize this whole exhibition. We only had three months and we pulled it off and I'm very, very proud of us. Welcome, all of you, and to only have three months to pull off all that you did, um, and we are going to talk more about what that is, is so impressive. I have to say, just as I've seen in the comments, right, there are some powerful women here with some uh, amazing experiences and backgrounds and film coming together in this beautiful way. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your film because it is uh, this documentary um, is chronicling the um the the project that you started um and as you mentioned right that that focuses in on augmented reality and so that is a very new terminology for me but i would love for you to talk more about just what you mean by that um in terms of the um you know what that is and then how it came into your film and the project that you are that you have um created Augmented reality basically is a technology that lets you see the world as it is around you. But we, via your smartphone, you can implement another object or objects into your own reality and enhance and augment your own reality. This is what augmented reality is. You can usually, like best case, you, you, you do this with your smartphone. Uh, that's all that you need, a smartphone and reception. Um, why did we think of augmented reality? We were talking about our public landscapes and our cityscapes and all the physical sculptures that we're surrounded with, which are more than 90% male and also made by male creators most of the time. And we thought, okay, how can we create a new balance and actually place sculptures of non-male identifying people into our public cityscape? with no funding at all <laughs> um, and with a very limited amount of time we were we were really passionate about the project and we figured we would love to do this as soon as is possible because this change needs to happen as soon as is possible and augmented reality seemed to be this amazing technology that both um, both uh, parts like fit in together, and uh, and so we decided very quickly that augmented reality would be that technology that we would use for this exhibition. I think that's beautiful because as as I was thinking about this that idea, right? The augmented reality is a fluid way of. of um, um, you know, imagery, but that so much symbolism, particularly in this, as you're saying, right? But it's so the op hard, solid, uh, you know, um, structure is how we look at when we see statues, which is so much of what you're, you're and shifting the perspective on through bringing these stories. So I think that's a beautiful way. And Josh says that's a smart and innovative way to tackle the problem. Yes, because you made it so efficient. And again, as you said, right, in three months, that's powerful to be able to have created this all in three months and all over um, New York City, correct? 
Yeah. All so, five boroughs. Um, all five boroughs. So tell me a little bit more about that and the process that went into it, because I think this is just so fascinating to understand how you even took on this project. Yeah, we were very lucky to partner with an artist called Erin Coe, and Erin Coe then introduced us to Katie Peyton Hofstetter, who became one of the co-founders for Hashtag Make Us Visible, the free online exhibition. If your audience wants to visit, they go to makeusvisible.io, and they can see all the monuments that we featured in the five boroughs of New York City. There are 31 pieces featuring over 31 artists that made this AR pieces possible. And so then we embarked on a really beautiful journey between Anne, Katie, and myself to curate and find these artists that we would feature to superimpose their really groundbreaking work dealing with a very important conversation on 31 physical structures around New York City. So each of these AR, augmented reality pieces, are designed to be superimposed on physical monuments that pre-exist in the streets of New York City. Generally, the physical monuments are of white men, generally glorifying war. And so these pieces were a counter conversation to that. And I think we've done a really great job of continuing the movement to not glorify war and what does it mean? And then the extended conversation is, do we need monuments at all? And what is the impact of these physical monuments on the streets where people live. Uh, alongside that, we got to partner with Nam Lee, who is the founder of Pollinate Art. And Pollinate really uh, made the AR possible to be viewed by the members of the public for free. So we really have to thank them tremendously alongside partnering with Beautiful Trouble, who made who we feature in the documentary documentary and explain how they, they supported us. But the process was really one where Katie, Anne, and myself sat down and got to look at monuments that impact the New York City public in a mainstream level, look at the five boroughs and where these main monuments are really featured and where people might be influenced subconsciously by these monuments, and then contact artists that are really groundbreaking in AR and or social justice movements and say, what piece might you like to have your AR work paired with and embarked on a very, really, really lovely, but long and time consuming process of making sure everyone felt curated and respected. And, and you know, we're still doing a lot of backlog work and, and we have some really exciting future projects. And then we got to meet Maimuna who helped us document this process. I love that. It's beautiful. And I do see we have some questions already. Kennedy Williams wants to know how long did it take to shoot and finish the film? I, I can take this. I mean, all in all, we started recording behind the scenes material um, when we started to get together, say, December, January, um, just like screen, like screen recording, Zoom recordings, like most, most of the time, it's really boring. We work remotely. Um, and we see each other uh, via the screen all the time, which is a, a un an unfortunate reality that all we have right time. now. We see um, each other all the time. <laughs> um, but then um, came April, My Muna came into the picture, and uh, we started working on the film uh, with My Muna then, which was really exciting. And then um, come summer, mm. we started to do the street interviews, um, which are like an uh, enormous, I think, emotional a part of the documentary that mm -hmm. I, I like very much. And, um, and yeah, then we finished in fall. So that was basically the timeline. I love that. And, and, and a, a very quick turnaround timeline, but beautiful and beautifully done. And I, I appreciate that you brought up the street interviews because I was thinking about that, as you said, Clara, that the subconscious messages, right? Um, what I heard was a lot of, um, <clears throat> a, a lot of those subconscious messages coming up in some of the interviews that are also coupled with talking about the AR and the monuments um, and the artists that are creating them. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more um, and about your own understanding or learnings that you kind of took away from some of those street interview conversations things that resonated with you or that you noticed. Uh, and um, and welcome, Stephanie. I see you in here as well. And Mimuna, if you wouldn't mind uh, starting off, I'd love to hear just what you took away from those conversations of others and their, uh, you know, their their thoughts on what what already exists in our statues. Yeah, uh, I mean, when I started interning with 
um, about hashtag make us visible. And I learned about, you know, how less of female or like uh, people in minority groups, they don't really have statues in New York City. And, you know, in New York City, I was expecting to have more statues of them. But when I started interning, I thought I was the only one who wasn't really aware of this issue. But when we were uh, interviewing strangers, I saw like, it's not just me. <laughs> a lot of people are not aware of this thing. And um, one of the one of the interview was really interesting because uh, the person we interviewed, they said uh, 121 or something like that about like she she thinks that oh, there are like more than 100 statues of women in New York City, but there were only five. And it was really surprising to her. And um, I thought about myself and I'm like, yeah, that's the exact um, reaction I had when I learned it for, for the first time. So, you know, to see like not a lot of people are aware of this thing, it really stood out to me and it really made me realize how how important this project is. So yeah, it was it was it and their um their responses were really really like nice, and to see like how different people answers differently it was really nice too. I'm really glad I I was able to be a part of that interview thing. It it really like helped me see like different views and opinions of people about our um, sculptural environment in New York City. And I also think because yeah. you said uh, about and the, going to jump in, yeah, because you you uh, talked about the subconscious. I figured it's extreme because these monuments tell us our history, right? Even though we might not really think about this every day, we walk past them every day, and this is basically what our history, history books tell us, and these history books were also very often or for a very long time written by men, and they are about the history of men, and it kind of seems like women didn't do anything, and this is absolutely not true. And this is why hashtag make us visible for me is also a chance to tell these stories and a chance to retell our history in a fuller picture. And during these um, street interviews, there was also one um, male person, and it, in the beginning, he was like, nah, I don't really care, you know, it's fine with the, with the statues and wow, whatever, I mean, I don't. And then after the interview, like the, one of the last things he said was like, like, now that I'm thinking of it, you're right, this should change, you know. And, and that, that was really powerful for us even to say that within five mm -hmm. minutes, there was this ah, yeah, there, there is some truth to that. And we should really think about it more because the subconscious is playing into that theme all the time. Yeah, well, that particular interviewee also taught me that I hadn't considered that there isn't a Frederick Douglass statue in New York City. There are certain memorials and streets and some other memorials to him, but there isn't a statue. The statue of him is in Washington, D.C. And this particular interviewee assumed that there must be one of Frederick Douglass and sort of was appalled to learn that there wasn't. And so A, taught me that there's a lot of assumption out there in terms of who we think we're memorializing. And then secondarily, like Anne's saying, what are we and who are we memorializing? And what is the value of that? And someone just by talking about it can change their thought process in five minutes, tells me that there's a lot of reflectiveness that can be taught and shared with one another that I think brings up important conversations. I, I love that. And, and that is so powerful in terms of thinking about that connection to the subconscious and the history, right? And, and what is visible? I think your language of choosing the idea of visibility is so powerful. Um, it, you know, the opposite, obviously, is the invisibility. And what you've done, as you've just shared with this story, particularly with this individual, right? And even Maimuna, as you were saying, right, like the visibility of something that people 
just didn't even realize it didn't exist through their assumptions. Um, so in that, and, and just thinking about, um, we're going to shift a little bit from the film to more of, of, of each of you individually, because, you know, what, what I've noticed in the creative spaces is that what we, what we bring to each of our projects is a personal story and our personal journeys and our experiences. Um, so as you're thinking about that, um, I love it. I see Stephanie Gale says she's in New York City <laughs> right now. I wish she had more time here to be. She can to, she can see the Munichs uh, for free if she wants to. They're free all year round, and you can see them at home as well. You don't it. have to be all year New York round. City. That's beautiful. Josh says I say pawn all the statues and give the money to charity. That's true. We, it's almost like the, the idea of, do we even need these solid figures when we can have so many other, um, you've created that way. You've created the outlet, right? So in terms of your own visibility, I'd love to know more about just as women, um, you know, what have been your own experiences of challenging this idea of ability in your lives where you have had to fight through that a lot? Well, uh, for me uh, personally, so uh, although my, my major is uh, emerging media, which is like media studies, but it deals with uh, new media art. And, um, but I've also taken many film classes in, in college. And um, one thing, and uh, I was born in Bangladesh, by the way, and in Bangladesh, uh, there aren't many women filmmakers. So, uh, and so that kind of made me think because, I mean, coming from a background where, you know, filmmaking and these are not really celebrated or these are not really thought as a career, especially for a woman. So it always made me question, like, am I going in the right path? Like, should I really be a filmmaker? Stuff like that. So it always, even today, it makes me question, like, am I doing the right thing, you know? So I really, I really do want to be, if I can, be a filmmaker in the future. And uh, I'm not sure, like, what kind of filmmaker. I'm not sure, like, where I want to be. Do I want to stay here? Do I want to make films back in my country? I still don't know those answers. But I do want to show people that, gender doesn't really matter in terms of like what you do and you know like where you go so and uh, thank you yes I am visible <laughs> and um yeah and if if I ever get the chance I would love to go back to my country and make a film and really like really like say that you know like there are women filmmakers, but they are not very visible in my country specifically. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, just, just have like a way to, to like represent women in filmmaking. So that's kind of like my personal um, visible story of being still a student, mm. but also a filmmaker. Oh, and I see Maymuna, I, Queen's World Film Festival, Maymuna, we see you, you are visible. And I have to say, from what I've just heard Clara and Anne say, you are definitely a filmmaker and you are very much pioneering this process. Uh, I have to give a shout out also to Bangladesh. I My mother is from Bangladesh, so I, we are sisters oh. in that way as well, Maymuna. Uh, yes. <laughs> and um, but but uh, and, and Clara, tell me a little bit about your experience in terms of this idea of visibility. This is a deep question. I thank you for bringing it up. I don't know if I can say anything profound <laughs> in the next five minutes, but I'll try. I'll speak out loud and hopefully it'll make some sense. I'm Italian-Australian. In many ways, I feel very visible. In many ways, I feel not very visible. I moved and immigrated to America as an artist. I was invited to come here and work with a conservatory for Japanese-American physical theater and dance. And in many ways, I feel very privileged about that and very lucky that I had this opportunity and I've continued to stay here and work. 
Then there are conversations that personally, I don't know, get my goat up, get me wanting to talk about stuff. Just before Anne came to us with this idea of hashtag make us visible to the XRE team, I had been in Florida, Sarasota, where there used to be a statue by Alfred uh, Einstein Stutz, I believe is his name, who did the photograph of the sailor and the nurse kissing at the end of the Western Second World War. And they'd made a giant statue of this piece that, that has its home in Sarasota, Florida, of all places. And when I was living down there, uh, which I probably, I don't know, maybe should admit, should admit, I don't know. Anyway, I was down there for a bit during the pandemic with some family friends. And there was a lot of outroar about the statue because it said that the, the nurse never consented to the kiss. And it was a, it was an, you know, oppressive photograph in many ways. And they sort of have glorified this image as a very romantic moment. And it's been made into statue, blah, 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 blah. And then we were also in the time of pulling down white supremacy statues as well in New York City. And I was tapped into those conversations. And being in Sarasota, I was part of a group that was talking about why are we making this particular photograph of physical statue invisible? And I don't want to take away from the artists that made the statue and their caliber and their work and all of that. I'm sure most of the things we come to are altruistic, but asking the question of when we make one thing visible, what's the other stuff we're either hiding or making visible alongside that and thereby glorifying. Anyway, this particular statue got removed in Sarasota and I think, I think it's on someone's private property and I think it's probably the right thing. But it brought up all these conversations and questions and, you know, coming from an Italian country, being an Italian national, surrounded by statues and monuments of all calibers, right, from glorifying individuals to a lot of, you know, cherubs and romanticized things and, and you know, problematic gender things, too. It's, it's a both end for me. I personally live in a space where if we really were going to respect and love each other equally egalitarianly why can't we all be naked in the street and all be clothed in the street and everyone can just sort of do what they want as long as they're not imposing on each other and that very much comes from my Italian lens of you know growing up with everyone naked in the house until everyone's like 13 kind of vibe but then the counter to that is the sexism that exists in my community and the very real gender oppression that exists in my community and glorifies that and you know watching Italian TV and all the men in suits and all the women in boob tubes and there's there's an elegance to that and then there's also a real oppression to that and so it's a complicated space so uh, thank you Josh says we can't do that in the USA we're not ready club <laughs> And, and maybe not all of that, but what you did say, which I love, is you talked about the idea of both ends, right? The complexity, I think, right, is that nothing is one way and one way to see it. Um, but there are so many layers to the idea of, you know, even just visibility, because then when you have something being visible, something is not, right? So there's there's a counter being lost somewhere within there as well. Um, so Anne, for you, what are what are your thoughts in terms of these experiences you've had in visibility? Um, <clears throat> I basically have two <clears throat> profound things from my very personal life. Um, one thing is I was born with anxiety, I think. So my first mission in this life was from very early on to cope with my anxiety and my depressions. And um, I felt that, like when I grew up in Germany, if you would say I go to psychotherapy, that was something ridiculed or looked frowned down upon or even something that would scar you. So when I decided I actually need help to, to get going and overcome my issues, um, I felt that making these issues visible was really helpful to all my surroundings, all the other people around me. When I started talking about my issues and when I was just very open and upfront about what was happening to me, everybody seemed to be relieved and opening up about their own fears and their own feelings. And that was like a huge thing for me. And and the second pain to power story, just for me, really personal, was um, to be a woman and to be allowed to have a career. And I'm the first one, mm. the first generation in my family where women are allowed to go to college. My mother could not. The family was not wealthy enough. And that weighed really heavily on her. So she was a housewife she took care of the family and my grandparents and everything i grew up with 
all the women that I could see were either housewives or teachers, basically. And it was like, yeah, and you, 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 you're supposed to study. It was always clear. My parents always told me, you should go to college. You should finish mm -hmm. college. But still, after that, it was like, and then you kind of marry and you have kids and that's it. That's just like how it is as a woman, right? And it's, I know it sounds weird but it was really tough for me to wrap my head around the fact that I need mentally to free myself from that picture because uh, in a very like mm. in a very serene way I understand that as a woman I can have a career but it was so ingrained in myself that it was really a struggle for me to say hey I really deserve to have an art career. I really deserve to have a music career and be paid for that and be paid good money, like a, a fair amount of money for that. And that was a huge struggle for me. It was incredible. And I was surprised about that. I was like, this cannot be that hard. Intellectually, I understand that. But emotionally, it was really, really tough for me. It's such a powerful thing, right, of how ingrained things are. And I think all of you just shared that, right? The subcut still makes a challenge in in transforming those narratives. Um, but also each of you are sharing how you've liberated yourself from those 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 limiting narratives and stories of what it is to be a woman or what the experiences are. Um, and I see we have some comments. I'm going to go to those comments and then we're going to take a quick commercial break in just a few moments. But I want to just uh, honor some of our comments. I said, Joss says, I uh, love the patent to power call back in. I did appreciate that. That was lovely. And yes, this is very much that idea of pain to power. Um, and uh, I, I know there were some other, it break down the barrier. Maybe. Yes. Yes, 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 definitely. Um, so we're going to, and thank you, Living Yashay Reviews is here with us, a piece. Um, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Um, as I had mentioned at the very start, I am a writer, and so we're going to learn a little about my story as a writer and what I have been working on in my publication. And then we'll be right back together to talk more to our amazing creative directorial team. Hi, my name is Maria but you are soon going to know me as Brown Girl Interrupting. Um, and what I mean by that is that very soon, hopefully, you're going to be following my blog. I am a writer, and I started writing because I was married, I had children, and then my life changed when I separated, and I did a lot of learning and reflecting and growing in that process of change because change always leads us to that. And I've decided or decided to share that with the rest of the world because sometimes hearing that someone else is going through the same thing as you or understanding and putting words to the feelings and experiences we're having helps us to heal from them or grow from them or learn from them. And so that's what my blog is. It's writing about life, healing, relationships, parenting, dating, marriage, pain, love, mistakes, growth, and coming out whole still in all of it as a human, flawed, but always open to new things. So that's my life. That's my journey. And it's written in this blog, but my hope is that you are going to go to www.browngirlinterrupting.com and join and subscribe to the blog and read all about my story to help you maybe gain some perspective on yours. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. And uh, yes, please go check out my blog. And ladies, I'd love to check it out. Um, it is called Brown Girl Interrupt. And it is my story of, of, of what I was fighting for a visibility of just the healing process and, and the transparency of what it is to, to make it through changes, um, which we all have. And, and it was the birth of this started with my writing so um so please everybody who is here in our audience and go check it out at www.browngirlinterrupting.com so 
one of the things that I loved as you were having these street conversations is you asked um, many individuals who would they honor as well. Um, and, and I want to bring it back a little bit to just thinking again about this theme of women and women in our lives. So if, you know, when you think about the women that you might honor or even that were inspired you to be just, it, you know, it's standing in the, in the skin that you're in, in the world that you now see in the view that you have, who are, who, what, who would be one of those women for you that has inspired um, your journey? I actually have to think about this for if you want to come back to me. For me, it was Tina Turner. I love her. She's my hero on so many different levels. Um, yeah, she would be the person that I would have a monument for. It's so interesting. I think we spent so much time curating. I really should have an answer to this, and I don't. There's so many people, RGB, I would say Caroline Edwards, like, you know, someone super famous, someone super personal to me, Kate Barge, a linguist that I was taught by who blew my mind in terms of, she's a, she's a linguist at Monash University, where I went to university. I didn't do linguistics, but I had this pipe dream that maybe I would one day. But she really analyzes the power of words how they coerce our brain, how they become powerful for our brain, the both and, today's thing for me is obviously both and, all of that. My father named me after a Anna Freud's best friend, Clara Lazaro Ghetto, who was a Freudian analyst, so I would probably honor her. But then also, you know, my best friend's mother and like what she did to teach us the value of like human compassion and, and, and love. So it's, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't have monuments anymore. There are so many people we should monumentize. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just as my mother would agree with you, Anne. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Clara too. It's just we have so many people to that we on like to honor and that we look up to that. It's hard to, you know, like pick just one. So, yeah, I also don't have specific one. I mean, there are so many like amazing writers that I follow, uh, filmmakers, and like there are so many people, actresses. I like there are amazing people out there, and it's just so hard to pick one. So, yeah, I don't have oh. one. I just had this idea. Yeah. Sorry. I was like, Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda did some really hardcore <laughs> activism, like at a time where like her demographic wasn't allowed to. I just want to like call that in. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Shout out to Jane Fonda. And, and, and for all of you, like, I think, yes, like there, it, it really is these instrumental people who have done huge things and 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 we know them really well you know whether whether it's through the entertainment and their boldness right or it's their their contribution to civil rights and social justice or or just personal people in our lives right there are so many women that inspire um i love because i i actually watched the film with my six-year-old daughter as i talked about and and and, and she was very interested uh she did her her fan is not not wasn't the full amount, I'm honest, but she definitely was very interested. And one thing that caught her, I think, was there was one statue that was of a scientist. And we started talking about this idea of a scientist um, because I, I think sometimes that's what it is, is visibility is truly the idea that you're bringing to light something that others didn't even consider before. So there are so many, and, and Clara, you mentioned it, right? A linguist, like who would think that at the same time, that's such a powerful position, right? A linguist, someone who talked about language and, and, and we, we use language all the time and, and we don't, we, we discount the role of, of every individual's impact on others through their craft. Um, and so many women particularly get discounted in those narratives. Um, and then when we add the layer of women of color, it's even greater, right? Like there's so much less you know, visibility in that. Um, so um, as we're, as we kind of close out tonight, I would love to know just in this journey, and, and I'm not a filmmaker, but I am a creative and I project, I create everything that I put out in the world. I, 
I learned something about myself as an individual. Um, I, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not so good, but, but I learned things, right? And so as you have put out this, this amazing, you know, I mean, three months, the, the pressure, the time, the, the, the remoteness of all of it, what have you learned about yourself in this process? Something that I've learned is that I work kind of good when I'm in pressure. <laughs> I mean, usually if you have more time, that's when you, you can like try out different things, you know, be more good at it. But I feel like when I'm in pressure, that's when my my brain might have just go like, you have to do it. You have to like, it tries to push out everything I have learned in all over the years. So yeah, that's what I've learned. And um, even though I get nervous and I panic, but I still, I still get the work done. <laughs> I've learned how, how lucky I am. I have such an incredible community from Maimuna and Anne and Mario, you interviewing us today, to Katha, Cato, and, you know, Don Preston for trusting us to put this movie up. We're you know, I'm an actor. I'm normally on the other side of the camera to trust me <laughs> to be part of the film team and produce this, to have them let us share the story was a big deal. And, you know, and and constantly sort of being through this process with us. And then our extended community, you know, the AR artists that trusted us to take on this project and share their art with us for a really important cause with no funding and we're sort of retroactively paying everyone as time moves forward and really supporting them in other ways as much as we can, you know, to really have this conversation and get council members on board to have this conversation with us. And, you know, Nihar at the Queen's World Film Festival, everyone really, the community, the process that this went on three months was much faster than we thought it would be. And to really learn that there's, there's a really incredible team that put this together in places we didn't know there, there were teams would be, you know, even Mr. M trusting us to, to, to connect with you and take it further. So, yeah. I think for me, a, a huge oh, thing you. that I learned was um, if you have an idea and you think it's worth pursuing, you can do it, even though if you think, oh my God, I, I'm not quite sure how we can pull this off and it's not enough time and we don't have money. And there's so many cons on the list, right? The pros are, if you, I don't know, it, it felt really like Clara and I, we believed in that. And against all odds, everything just happened because we went step by step and we lucked out probably to get introduced to the right people and I'm really really grateful and we worked really really hard so it was not just something that just came to us we really really worked hard but the work paid off and that was a really beautiful thing to see for me that I sometimes felt against all odds and multitasking is a reality it's not a myth and like we, we had to juggle so many things at the same time and that that was something for me that yeah thank you very much that that was inspiring to me as well because I just felt like hey, okay we just go from one next step to the next next step and then we in the end we will end up where we want to end up and it happened and it was great But that's a powerful mindset, right? And and I think coupling that with the community and then recognizing the time constraints are, you know, are, are real, but but for some we we work better in them, right? <laughs> right. So that that's that it all flows together so beautifully. And and that is what created this this beautiful documentary and this and and beyond that, right? Documentary is this wonderful film that please everybody go and watch. The link is all in the in the um the chat. Please go check out the um, the films and and while you're there, go and watch many amazing films that came from the Queen's World Film yes. Festival. You definitely don't want to miss. Uh, and mm -hmm. as as we have lifted up, you can experience these monuments that in the AR monuments to for hashtag Make Us Visible in your at your home. You can experience. Yes. Now. Can you just give us some? Where do we go? So, everybody to experience pull, all of this. 
Yes, everybody right now, pull your phones up, get into a web browser, type in makeusvisible.io and scroll the web page. You'll see the New York branch, the Munich branch, the Venice branch, other cities to come. And you just you sort of search the website and you'll see a thing that says view in AR. Click on that view in AR, it'll pop up in your Instagram filter. And you can see the artwork. You can see these incredible monuments honoring non-binary people and women in the comfort of your bedroom. So check them out. And they truly are incredible. I mean, we, my, my, as I said, my daughter and I, we were just fascinated by the imagery and the different, you know, the colors and everything. Like they're just beautiful. And, and you mentioned so many other cities. So you are spreading worldwide, international in this, um, which is beautiful, and so many opportunities to go and, and do that. Um, I did see in the chat that in addition, this is not the only project. I am very excited because I get to experience the the next project that you have coming on, which is Letters Without Borders. I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about what that is, when it's going to be showing, so that if you now you could actually be in person in New York to experience uh, some other AR um, visions that Anne and Clara have been developing as well. So yes, tell us yes. a little bit about Letters Without Borders. Thank you so much. So Letters Without Borders is a performance art weekend from the 26th to the 27th of November, the Saturday and Sunday after Thanksgiving. If you're looking for something thankful to celebrate, we'd love to have you join us at Letters Without Borders. It's going to be a poetry artistic fusion with AR, AI, and any other digital? Yes, and digital art. Looking at the similarities and the togetherness that as immigrants we share when we're on new lands, whatever new lands means. And the letters is a metaphor, either a literal letter that you're sending back to your respective home or the text messages you send to your loved ones at that respective home, the telepathic messages you send to the loved ones back home. And then our long-term vision is a hologram version of this that Anne had a vision for of the past, present, and future, right? Sort of the messages we send to those we love, ancestral in the past, present, and future. So most of the artists presenting are immigrants to New York City. We are acknowledging the unceded lands of the land people that we'll be performing on and then having a conversation of what it means to move across space and how we communicate as we move across space. Beautiful. And I am honored to be able to experience it in person. So I will be there, which I am very excited. Excited to hope that many people will be there. And as 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 just a spoiler alert, please stay tuned on Brown Girl Interrupting because you will see um, some conversations with the artist next week on Saturday and Sunday. We'll be broadcasting them live from Brown Girl Interrupting on YouTube for you to meet some of the artists as well as hear their stories. And of course, hear more from our wonderful creative directorial team as well. Um, and so thank you so much to all of you, Maimuna, Clara, and like thank you, thank you for thank you. for sharing your um, your vision and for for this creation of this vision, right? And then as a team, all of you coming together to this create this beautiful documentary. And uh, you know, really, what I'm what I'm hearing is this, this um, awakening of others to start interrogating the experience, the, the environments and the things around us um, to, to really recognize, do we really have all the voices? And, and I feel that your film and your project truly encapsulate this, um, this interrogation of the norms that we've created. Um, so thank you so much for your time and for committing to doing all of this. And thank you to Geologic, my producer, Mr. M, also known as. Um, and of course, to the Queen's World Film Festival yeah. for all of the amazing films and for introducing me to these amazing men. Um, and to you, to uh, you. You work so good. Go you. Oh. Yes. Ooh. Thank you. I Lots of love. It. I appreciate it. This has been an honor.
I'm sending all that love back. I'm looking forward to sending that love in person <laughs> in just a few days um, in New York, which is going to be lovely. And so with that, um, you know, we are closing out our show. And I'm so glad that all of our audience, our Branters family came and supported some of our other family. I saw our Queens World Film Festival family came and supported and so many others Amanda says thank you ladies and thanks for the beautiful work of art and thank you Amanda for checking in and being here today and so with that I am going to say good night to everyone and please make sure that you tune in for uh, our interviews and conversations from Letters Without Borders on Saturday and Sunday, as well as please tune in to Pain to Power next week. I am featuring Tasha Brown, the host of No Hold Facts. And please, ladies, hopefully you'll be able to, I know you'll be exhausted, but if you can't see it, then please watch it. Um, she is amazing and has this beautiful way of talking about vulnerability and honesty and and puts people on the hot seat but i love it <laughs> and uh and definitely don't want to miss next sunday november 27th at not be here with brown girl interrupting on the ranchers union and on the i rant network and please continue to make sure that you go and watch hashtag make us visible all the links and information is below go check out the exhibits and and the all of the monuments that have been created through AR, through all of these amazing artists. Um, please go follow Maimuna and Clara and Anne, and of course me as well, if you haven't done that yet. And if you're in New York, come attend Letters Without Borders. Yay. Thank you again. You Have a beautiful night. See you soon. See you soon. See you soon. Anne and Clara were telling me about the project and they said, you know, there are 150 statues to individuals, historical, allegorical, and literary figures in New York and only five of them are women. And then I paused for a second and I said, how many horses are there? We can change this. We can change this really easily uh, with augmented reality. Concern of the permanence of your love robs me of all enjoyment. It's not even a challenge. Who would you like to honor? And people immediately are inspired to start working. Everybody was excited. Concern of the permanence of walking around the five boroughs and experiencing the AR and feel the power of these pieces was overwhelming. Why are there more horses than women? More horses than women. Hashtag more horses than women. My world has slowly crumbled around me countless times, and every time I rebuild with the pieces I've been given to birth something so transformational and beautiful that no one else knew might exist before it was shown to them. These moments tend to coincide within my romantic path. The universe has been telling me to focus on the revolution and not romance. It has over time given me the tools, resilience, and light to turn my pain into power. And only now do I see that the key to this always resided in the love and knowing I had in myself, not from the external sources of family or men. The message I have been avoiding might be that my time in this world I had existed in was not to receive love, but to put it out there for others to see, feel, and heal through. Revolution before romance moves pain into power.